After the resurrection, Jesus appeared several times to his disciples, sometimes to one or two of them, sometimes to a group, and then to a larger group. The opening lines of this gospel passage that the deacon proclaimed for us are significant in terms of uh, historical reality. And it makes a good comparison for your reflection and for mine. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were, and now this is uh, the part of the sentence that has some food for thought. For fear of the Jews. Let's reflect on that for a moment. For fear of the Jews, they had locked themselves. You know, fear does that to people. We either lock ourselves in or we lock the, the physical property so that anything that's a threat to us is outside, cannot get in. That's what we do. And that's what they did. With Mary, the mother of Jesus, they had locked themselves up for fear of the Jews. Why? Because they felt that the master is taken away. It's coming to be our turn now. And that happens, happened before, it happens even today. When the leader is taken, all those who were associated with the leader are then taken. It has happened time and time again. Under those circumstances, what were they doing in the locked room? Two things, I think. I think it seems to us that this would be what they were doing. First, remembering. They were strengthening the remembrance. And they were calling to mind everything that Jesus had said on different occasions. Secondly, they were praying because they wanted that somehow they would have the power to withstand anyone who would now come after them. And then Jesus comes in. And he says those beautiful words, comforting words, words that we long for many a day in life, even now. Peace be with you. The outside world was in turmoil. Gruesome things had happened. And then Jesus comes in and he says, peace be with you. Calm down. Calm down. Peace be with you. And they were all stunned. I do this, you know why? Because Father Arnolfo, he's not here, so I can say this, he's not present. And don't, I dare anyone to tell him I said this. Okay. <clears throat> he loves to come very quietly, and I'll be in the kitchen or someplace, and he say, Padre! And I go like this. And then he laughs. He likes to see the elderly shake about with his voice, you know. Okay, no. That's just to bring, you know, how we get surprised in life. Now, it's not always something that stirs the air, but it's something that could be quiet, that also is a response to fear. We are afraid of the leaders in the, among the Jewish people. Now we get this person who comes in and says, peace be with you. How do we put this all together? <clears throat> now, my brothers and sisters, our second reflection is this. One among the 12 was not there. Guess who? And we, history has always remembered the poor man as the... Doubting Thomas. I don't think you guys are very fair to him. <laughs> Doubting Thomas. I want to offer a side of reflection to Thomas's behavior. For whatever reason, Thomas was not there. I like to think that perhaps it was his turn to go out and find some food. Buy some food, I should say. And while he was away, Jesus appeared to them. And he says, peace be with you. So when he returns back, they say to him, hey, Thomas, 
we have seen the Lord. Now mind you, Thomas knew about the death, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, all of that. But now, according to human ways of thinking, that's the finality. Death is the finality. Now he's come back to life, but he told us that. And it was beginning to sink in that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. But he didn't say, I'm going to come and visit you. So the visit was a shock. And when he came in and said, peace be with you, they must have, you know, just tremored a little bit. I also want to say that here's a point for our reflection. Poor Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas for centuries. What was Thomas really wanting? I think, when I taught theology, I even said it there. <clears throat> I told you this before, I shared with you before, I had a couple of uh, Jewish students in, in my class and um, they would ask me all kinds of questions. I think what Thomas was looking for is the same experience that the other 11 had. I think he was looking for that. Because Jesus appeared to them, Thomas wasn't there. The next week, Jesus appears again, Thomas is there. And Thomas originally had said, I don't think I'm going to believe this until I see with my own eyes. He wanted that same experience that they had of the presence of the risen Christ. Nothing wrong in thinking that way. It simply shows that the soul yearns for, longs for, the peace that Jesus gives. And then Jesus, when he appears the second time, he says to Thomas, Tommy, touch. See the wounds. Put your fingers here. Put your hand into my side. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Thomas had the experience to which he responded, my Lord and my God. Thomas was looking for that divine love that Jesus could give, that his death had assured them but in all the confusion that followed the death and the burial and the empty tomb and all of that confusion, Thomas needed to be reminded again that it's mercy and love that Jesus gives. Mercy and love. There is no mercy without love. There is no love without mercy. As we observe this Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter, as Divine Mercy Sunday, we too are looking for that experience of inner peace that comes from Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters, we can get shook up by all that the world has to say, but it's only faith that answers our quest for peace, faith in the risen Christ, and the empty tomb tells the story as it has for hundreds of years and hundreds of years to come, and you and I need to reassure the world that Jesus is risen, Jesus is merciful, Jesus still loves us. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, 